This video is part one of chapter 14, and in chapter 14 we'll be discussing genes and how they are inherited. So what principles account for the passing of traits from parents to offspring? Recall in chapter 13 we talked about how meiosis and sexual life cycles pass traits on from one another. But what, how does this occur and what happens when the traits are passed down? Well, one of the original hypotheses was that traits blended, meaning that the trait from the father and the trait from the mother blended together to make the offspring's trait. For instance, if a flower was blue in one organism, a male for example, and yellow in a female, the offspring would have green flowers. The other idea or hypothesis was the particulate hypothesis that stated that parents pass on discrete units to their offspring, and these units are called genes. Mendel, or Gregor Mendel, who was who is considered the father of modern genetics, documented the particulate mechanism of inheritance through his experiments with garden peas. Mendel, although not being a formally trained scientist, was an excellent researcher and an excellent scientist, and he discovered the basic principles of heredity by setting up very carefully planned experiments using garden peas. His approach allowed him to figure out principle of inheritance that had remained puzzling to many other scientists at the time, and this was in the mid-1800s. What he defined was that a heritable feature that varies among individuals is called a character. So for example, flower color would be a character, flower, or a plant height would be a character. <clears throat> Each variant of a character, for example, purple or white flowers, is called a trait. And Mendel defined these based on his experiments using peas, and he used peas because they're very easy to mate, easy to harvest, easy to count, things like that. What he chose in peas was he chose only to track characters that occurred in two distinct alternative forms, meaning there weren't three particular traits for particular characters, so flowers were purple or white, and that was it. He also used varieties that he termed true breeding, meaning they were plants that always produce offspring of the same variety when they self-pollinate. So purple flowers mating with themselves only produce plants with purple flowers. White plant, plants with white flowers mated together only produce plants with white flowers. This is a very important control mechanism that he figured out and used. In a typical experiment, what he would do was he would mate two different true breeding varieties, a process called hybridization. The true breeding parents are what we refer to as the P generation, or parental generation. The hybrids are what we refer to as the F1 generation, or the first um, offspring generation. And then he made it F1s together to get what we call the F2 generation, or the second hybrid generation. The first thing that Mendel discovered or, or figured out was what is called the law of segregation. And before we get to what that is exactly, we need to follow through the process that Mendel conducted and the experiments that he did. So when he mated two true breeding plants, one with white flowers and one with purple flowers, all of the F1s were, or were purple. Now they were hybrids, but they all exhibited purple flowers, so he was puzzled by that. When he crossed those F1s together, many of the F2 plants had purple flowers, but some had white. And he figured out that the ratio of purple to white was about 3 to 1. So after observing this, he sought to figure out how this occurs. So we're going to go through more of his observations and look at how, or look at what he determined from these observations. So here's a diagram of that. He took true breeding purple flowers, purple flowered plants, and crossed them with true breeding white flowered plants. All the F1 had purple flowers. He self-pollinated these. About three out of four of the F2 were purple flowered plants, and about one out of four were white flowered, so it was a ratio of three to one, so three-fourths were purple, one-fourth were white. <clears throat> so he developed a hypothesis to explain this inheritance pattern, and there are four concepts that make up the model for this hypothesis, and these also can be related to what we know about genes and chromosomes. Keep in mind, Mendel did not know what genes or chromosomes were, because they hadn't been discovered at, that, at the time in which he was doing his experiments. So the first thing he figured out was that alternative versions of genes account for variations in these inherited characters. Notice we're using the term gene here, even though Mendel didn't know what they were. So we'll just go ahead and use modern terminology. For example, the gene for flower color 
in plants exists in two versions, one for purple and one for white. We call these alternative versions of a gene alleles. So alleles are similar to traits and genes are similar to characters. So there's a gene for flower color, which is a character. There are traits for flower color, purple and white, which are called alleles. Each of these alleles reside at a specific locus on a specific chromosome. We talked a little bit about this in chapter 13. Keep in mind, Mendel didn't know about all of this stuff, but we're still going to associate what he found with modern day understanding. So let's say we've got two chromosomes in an organism. At one point, there's the allele for purple. That's the locus for that allele. And the locus for white is in the corresponding place on the other chromosome. When the purple flower allele is expressed or is found in conjunction with the white, all of the flowers are purple. That's because the purple allele leads to the production of a purple color, whereas the white allele leads to the production of nothing. So therefore, all of the flowers are going to be purple if they have the purple allele or trait. Second, for each character, an organism inherits two alleles, one from each parent. Again, Mendel made this deduction without really knowing about chromosomes. He just figured it out. So if the two alleles at a particular locus are identical, we would call that the true breeding plant. If they are different, that is the F1 hybrid. Third, if two alleles occur at a locus and they are different, then one determines the organism's appearance. That's what we call the dominant allele. The other allele, or the recessive allele, has no noticeable effect on the appearance. So in the F1, the flowers were purple because the purple flower allele is dominant. What he came up with then from all this information is what we call the law of segregation. And what the law of segregation states is that the two alleles for a particular character segregate or separate during gamete formation or meiosis and end up in different gametes. So therefore an egg or a sperm gets only one of the two alleles that are present in the organism for a particular gene. The segregation of the alleles corresponds to the distribution of homologous chromosomes into different gametes and meiosis that we saw in chapter 13. <clears throat> this model accounts for Mendel's 3 to 1 ratio of, of, care, of uh, traits seen in the F2. The possible combinations of sperm and egg can be shown using a model or a tool we call a Punnett square. Using Punnett squares, we always represent alleles with different letters. We represent a capital letter as the dominant allele and a lowercase letter as the recessive allele. Here's an example of that. So let's say we have true breeding purple flowers, which we know have both purple alleles, true breeding white, both have white alleles. Notice that the white allele is a lowercase p, not a w. That's very important. You never mix letters. So if we identify the dominant as a big P or capital P, we're going to identify the recessive allele as the lowercase p. Okay. Each of these can only donate one particular kind of gamete to the offspring. In this case, for the purple flower, it's going to be a purple allele. For the white, it's going to be a white allele. Put those together, we get the F1 hybrid, which has purple flowers, but notice it has one of each allele. When these segregate during meiosis, half of them are going to have the big P, half are going to have the little P. When we put this into a Punnett square, we represent the gametes as the individual allele. So up here we have the sperm from one plant, so half of them are big P, half are little P. Over here we have the eggs, big P, little P. We put them together to represent reproduction and we get all of our offspring. Notice that the ratio is 3 to 1 for the purple to the white trait. As you can tell, there's lots of vocabulary in genetics, and you have to understand the vocabulary before you can really understand the concepts. So let's look at some more vocabulary. If an organism has two identical alleles for a character, we call that individual homozygous. An individual can be homozygous dominant, meaning it's got both dominant alleles, or it can be homozygous recessive, meaning it has both recessive alleles. If an organism has one dominant and one recessive allele, we call it heterozygous. We do not refer to a heterozygous individual as heterozygous dominant or heterozygous recessive. It's just heterozygous. Heterozygotes are not true breeding, whereas homozygous individuals are. Some other vocabulary we look at or we need to examine is phenotype and genotype. Phenotype is the physical appearance or what you see in the organism, whereas the genotype is the genetic makeup. 
Phenotype and genotype are not always the same. If we look at the purple flowers in the F2 generation, remember that three out of four of all the offspring were purple. But notice that one out of the three is homozygous dominant. The other two out of the three are heterozygous. Even though they have the same phenotype, they don't have the same genotype. However, for any individual that exhibits the recessive phenotype, they will always have the homozygous recessive genotype. The second thing that Mendel determined from his work was the law of independent assortment. What he did when he looked at one single character was what we call a monohybrid cross, where he was only look at, looking at one particular character, in the case we saw before, flower color. And a cross between individuals such that where we only consider one character is called a monohybrid cross. He wanted to see what happened when he crossed individuals that differed at two characters. So we call that a dihybrid cross. So now we're going to look at what happens when we look at how two different characters are inherited in an organism. In this case, he came up with two hypotheses. The hypothesis of dependent assortment and the hypothesis of independent assortment. Don't get scared by the Punnett square here. It may seem a little crazy, but it's not as bad as you think. In the F1s of any organism that is the, that is the result of a dihybrid cross, we're going to have four different gametes. We're going to go over this more in class so you'll understand it better. But notice what we get here. We get a 4x4 four four Punnett. What Mendel observed in his F2 results from his dihybrid cross was a phenotype ratio of approximately 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. That corresponded to an independent assortment hypothesis. What that means is each pair of alleles segregates independently of the other pair during gamete formation. And this applies to genes on different chromosomes. So what it means is that dominant alleles from one gene don't always get inherited with the dominant alleles from a second gene, nor do the recessive alleles from one gene always get into inherited with the recessive alleles of a second gene. We will spend more time on this in class to make sure everybody understands. As you might have already figured out, probability is important in Mendelian inheritance, and the laws of probability, probability govern Mendelian inheritance. So we can use the laws of segregation and independent assortment and address the probability of certain things happening when we cross individuals with differing phenotypes and genotypes. The first rule of probability is what we call the addition rule, or the rule of addition. This states the probability that any one of two or more independent events that can occur by themselves added up give us the probability of a specific event. So for example, if three out of four individuals are purple in a monohybrid cross, the probability of getting any purple flower is going to be three-fourths. We would add one-fourth plus one-fourth plus one-fourth. And we can use the rule of addition to figure out lots of different probabilities. The multiplication rule, by contrast, states that the probability of two or more independent events occurring together is the product of their probability. What that means is if we want to find out what the chances of a mating giving three purple plants, purple flower plants, is we would multiply the probability of the individual plant being produced each time together, and that would give us the overall probability using the multiplication rule. We can use all of these probabilities, Punnett squares, and all of this stuff to solve genetics problems, and we're going to spend a lot of time on these in class.